this is going to be a yellow stain video. It's going to be kind of a hybrid color between an antique yellow as well as, a, I guess, a more modern amber look to it. It's just one of several variations that you can end up getting with this wood die kit. But um, I'm taking a 150 grit on a wood hammer here that I ended up turning out on the lathe. Now, I'm not going to be doing a video tutorial on how I actually made this wood hammer. There's several tutorials on YouTube already about making wood hammers, and some guys do a really good job on it. Uh, YouTube just doesn't need me to end up putting a, another video out about how to make a wood hammer. So I started out with the 150 grit on the lathe itself. I took it off the lathe, I brought it over to my downdraft table, and I'm going to be using a 220 grit dual action sander on this process here. The reason I took it off the lathe is because I didn't want cross cuts in my sanding on the wood itself. When you're spinning it on the lathe on my final sand, at least for me, I always end up with these little cross cut scratches. So I took it off the lathe to put the the 220 grit dual action sander to it and that's just how I do it um, you can do it however you want but that's just what I did so this is reverse osmosis water it's purified water and I'm using the Kita dye stain wood dye kit it's gonna be uh, working with the yellow and the golden brown that's 1 4 teaspoon and I'm gonna say it's about a tablespoon maybe two tablespoons of the water. It was just a splash of water in there. So it's maybe about an ounce at tops. So that was 0.75 grams of the yellow. And the brown, that's a 1 8 teaspoon. And I'm gonna say it's about maybe 1 fourth full of the brown dye. But if you're gonna weigh it out, it's 0.1 grams or 0.11 grams. Anywhere around 0 0.1, 0 0.09, 0 0.1, 0 0.11, it would be fine. And then I take 70% rubbing alcohol, and I take 4 ounces of the rubbing alcohol, and I end up adding it to the to the reverse osmosis or purified water with the dyes in it. So I bring it back over to the lathe, and I'm about to put my first coat down on it. Now the wood here itself is a flowering crab apple wood. <clears throat> excuse me that um, this wood actually came from a tree in my mother's backyard you know I kind of grew I, I did I grew up with this tree uh, you know when I learned to ride my bike I ran into the tree when I got a mini bike I, I voided the tree and hit the corner of the house <laughs> when I get when I turned a teenager I ended up uh, I got a KX 250 for my one of my birthdays and I ended up you know, hitting that tree, I played in the tree, I climbed in the tree, you know, so it was, you know, it was sad to hear that it was dying, and, you know, it was just old, it, you know, it was estimated to be over 100 years old, so uh, I wanted to get some wood from this tree, just because, you know, I wanted to make some things from it, I had a lot of fond memories of that tree, and I know that sounds kind of foolish, it's just a tree, but, you know, it's just something I grew up with, so anyways, I took it off of the lathe after my first coat, uh, this is my hair dryer that I keep in my workshop to try to accelerate the drying process and I took the two the 220 grit dual action sander and I'm working it back down on the wood uh, there's going to be some areas that I end up sanding heavier than others because that's the look that I wanted to get with it I wanted to have some a little bit of an uneven look where there's going to be some areas that I take back down to the bare wood and some that I, I don't this isn't a, a very highly figured wood um, so I wasn't really sure because I've never ever finished this type of wood before and I wasn't sure how things were going to end up laying out, but I got to say, I think that it turned out really nice. The camera doesn't catch a lot of, of what's really going on in person and the details and how deep the coloring and the finish just actually looks in person. But, um, hopefully you can get some glimpses of, of what it would end up looking like and the color that that I end up seeing at the final end of it um, it looks pretty true to, to how it ends up looking in person so anyways I bring it back over to the lathe I take the clean cloth and I just end up getting any of the loose debris the sanding dust and things like that off of the the surface of the wood and then I end up going back over it with my my second application uh, of the dye stain uh, of the, I'm sorry the, yeah of the yellow dye stain over the the first coat that I ended up sanding down so the the tree like I said was it was getting old it just was 
literally there was limbs that were falling off of it um it was just getting dangerous so we ended up taking it down took chainsaws and i cut big sections of the tree apart and i took some of the wood myself for some for woodworking and some that i was going to end up using for fire uh, for firewood and i specifically use it for cooking like if i i made myself like this tripod that goes over the fire and you can cook cook food on it and um it really makes the food taste absolutely fantastic so um it's a good wood to to cook with that's for sure and this is my first project trying to to do something with the wood itself to make something from it and i needed to make a a round um, wood hammer and that's what i ended up making with this and I was, so i wasn't really too concerned over the finish but it's been very humid in Wisconsin for the summer of 2018. And I did start having some troubles with the shellac just because it is so humid. Um, I did seal this with the shellac. So I poured about, I'm going to say about two ounces of the shellac into a separate container. I ended up adding two drops of the key to dye amber liquid yellow. And I'm just mixing that in good. It's just going to be just a slight tint. Now, if I would put that on, a, on a, a raw wood, it would have just a very slight yellowing uh, color. I mean, it would not It would hardly even uh, show up, but it would have just a very slight yellowing effect to it. So do you need to end up adding the liquid dye to this? Probably not. You'd probably be just fine. It'd be a very similar color representation and depth with just the, with the powder dyes itself, but... I just wanted to add a little bit extra to it just because, you know, like I said, of the sentimental value that this piece had. Um, <clears throat> it is a hammer, so I'm, like I said, I'm not too too worried really about the finish. It's going to get beat up and, you know, I'll probably end up having to refinish it again in a year or so. But um, it was just something that I wanted to do. And I figured, well, if I'm going to do it, then I may as well record it just to, you know, have another little recording for people to end up seeing if they wanted to end up making a certain type of color and I noticed that I didn't have very many yellows uh, for coloring so I decided well I better do something with a yellow so that's what this is it really reminds me of like an antique yellow like the old Japanese yellows and um, with their wood crafts uh, I've really been doing a lot of research and you know, learning about the Japanese and their woodworking techniques and crafts. And oh, it's just amazing what, what some of them guys can do. So uh, that's kind of what my take is on, on that color. So anyways, I'm just going over this now very lightly, very gentle on the very first coat. I just really am trying to, to get some of the, the sealer on there uh, very lightly. I'm not trying to disturb the dyes very much. Then I just turn my speed up on the lathe a little bit to try to help dry it. But like I said, it's very humid. And that's not such a good idea when it's very humid because I don't, I, sh I should have known better. But um, oh, I, I just did I did what I did. So with the, the moist air running over it, it started to end up getting some fish eyes and some voids. Not on this one here, uh, but later on in the video, you'll end up seeing how, how that works out. So one lesson to learn from this, if anything, is make sure that when you're finishing that your, your humidity is not over, I'm going to say 55%. That's what my grandfather always told me. Um, I should have listened to that lesson. And, uh, but it's not a big deal. Like I said, it's just a hammer. But that's something to keep in mind is humidity when you're doing your sealing and applying a sealer to it. So I turned off the lathe and I was just applying it by hand and you know I'm just rotating it around trying to to get the the, the very first coat well not the very first coat but the, the first actual coat and here I started running that lathe again and there was more uh, that moist air that was running across the the surface of that wood sealer and that's not a that's not a good thing when it's when it's very humid out. Here's my second mistake. Uh, I know, I know that 400 grit is is too fine of a grit for a between coat sanding, 
but you know shellac burns pretty well back into itself uh, I was and I'm not doing a polish or nothing I'm just running a very fine very gentle um, seal or sanding over the top of that shellac I, I was just trying to kind of even it out if you're going to end up doing between coat sandings, you probably want to stay around a 220 grit, 320 maybe at the tops, but 400 is kind of pushing it. And here's my other mistake. I'm touching it with my hands. I don't ever do that. I, I always try it. Once I end up, this, once I get into the sealing process, I try to keep my fingers off of the sealer as much as I can. I'm always using gloves that uh, I don't want my finger oils back on the sealer. I don't want to take any chances of any variables to end up creating some kind of misruns or defects in my my wood sealing application. Do I think that that had an impact on this? I don't think as much as the the hu high humidity did, but again, it's uh, like I said, it's a hammer, so I wasn't quite as concerned with the the final finished product results, and I wasn't looking for an absolute glass finish. But so, anyways, while I was running my my lathe and applying that shellac I ended up getting some of the fibers from the cotton cloth that ended up grabbing because it was so humid um, and the shellac started really grabbing onto that cotton cloth and one of the things that ended up happening was I ended up getting some of the fibers onto the the cotton cloth so um, I always keep a tweezers by nearby for when I'm doing my sealing process so that way if something does happen I can try to pull it out before uh, the sealer starts to cure and set so here's another mistake. So now I'm doing 1500 grit. Yeah, the 400 wasn't wasn't bad enough, right? But so now I take a 1500 grit and I'm going over the top. But again, I'm just trying to, I guess, scratch the surface is all I was really thinking here. Um, I wasn't running it at a high speed. I wasn't trying to polish it or anything like that. I just really because you can see on the sandpaper itself that because it was so humid that it just wasn't really working right and the the lower grit sandpapers were just acting so much more aggressive but you can see there that it, it did kind of polish out a little bit more than than I should which is probably not good either and I did let it sit a little bit longer so the humidity was probably already starting to set onto the the surface of the sealer um, for the shellac and then when I went and I sprayed on top of it it was grabbing the so the shellac was being atomized and it was grabbing the moisture from the air and then going onto the the wood surface see there you can see it right there they're starting to miss run and I'm getting little voids and fish eyes all over the place so was it from my fingers or was it from the moisture I'm gonna say that it was from the moisture in the air it was just so humid but um, you know like I said it's a it's a hammer so I really did it more for the coloring, so I'm hoping that that concept ends up, uh, you know, translating for somebody that's gonna be looking for more of kind of like an antique or uh, just a yellow stain that's got a really nice coloring to it. Um, I, I really wish that the camera could really capture the depth and just the the, sh the real beauty that this thing ended up having um, for the color and you know the depth, the finish, the look. It just really ends up having such a beautiful depth. Oh, you can see some of it right there, but um, it's just it's just an amazing finish on here. It really is, even though it's got the mist runs and all of that other stuff. But um, it's the first time I've ever worked with the flowering crab wood, and um, you know the dyes did a really good job on on adding a really nice depth to it. It looks very clean. It just really turned out really nice. It's got really nice depth to it, and it really has a nice sheen and a shimmer underneath the, the shellac. So I really hope that this ends up giving a good demonstration for the color, how I got to it. You know, the process that I ended up doing to, to color it with the lathe and um, just the general overall. But it, And it's a different wood for you guys that are always out there complaining about using different woods. It's a different wood. This is actually from my mother's backyard, so it doesn't get any better than that, right? Uh, so I hope that that satisfies you guys even. And, um, you know, I just really hope that it ends up helping in, um, you know, showing a little more versatility with the with the dye itself as well as uh, another color that I could end up getting out here for people that are looking for color formulas for certain things. 
but you know you can always end up making it a little more orange by adding a little bit red to it if you want a little bit darker just add a little bit more brown you may not need quite as much yellow but I tried to do a little bit heavier because the camera never picks it up quite as well but this one turned out really nice so thanks you guys for watching I really appreciate it and I hope you enjoyed it thank you what a terrible position. Oh yeah, and